Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, this is Dharmasar Taro, and I'm here with the 19th episode of Nibbana, the secret treasure of the Buddhas. Last time we talked about four kinds of nutriments that fuel the process of becoming. And they're given in the Ahara Sutta. Ahara means food or nutriment. So what are these four? They are physical food, gross and subtle, contact, intellectual intention, and consciousness. Now intention is also fabrication. Because when we intend to do something, especially when we intend to create I, or to uh, make something ours as mine, we have to fabricate that because it doesn't really exist. It's not a Dhamma. It's something that we create. So using the process of dependent origination, we, out of ignorance, we create a fabrication. And that fabrication leads to a certain type of consciousness. And because of that consciousness, then we develop a name and form, and so on. And we went through all the stages of dependent origination in the previous episode. So, the point is, when these four kinds of nutriments are removed, the whole process of dependent origination collapses. The whole process of becoming in this physical world comes to an end. And this is exactly the point of the Buddha's teaching. So now the Buddha also said something very insightful, that all four of these nutriments, all four of the types of nourishment for the process of becoming, come through craving. Craving is the one thing that ties all these four together. So if we can cut craving at the root, just like a plant, uh, the root feeds the plant. Without the root, the plant simply dries up and it doesn't grow back. So in similar way, if we want to stop this process of becoming that has us going through the samsara, around and around, birth and death in this world, if we want to stop the cause of suffering, then we have to deprive the process of becoming of its nutriment. Buddha Das Bhikkhu gives a wonderful example. He says, suppose you have a tiger in a cage and you have to kill the tiger. So how are you going to kill the tiger? The tiger is bigger, stronger, faster, and meaner than you are. <laughs> so if you go in there with a knife or a club or something, the tiger's going to beat you. So what's the best way to kill the tiger? Simply starve it to death. Don't feed it anything, and it'll die all by itself. So similarly, if we deprive the process of becoming of its nutriments, of its food, then that's the same as cutting it at the root. That's the same as uprooting craving, uprooting desire. So when we cut out this nutriment, it's like cutting the plant at the root. It doesn't grow back because it's not getting any nourishment. So the Buddha continues in the Ahara Sutta. Now, from the remainderless fading and cessation of that very ignorance comes the cessation of fabrications. From the cessation of fabrications comes the cessation of consciousness. From the cessation of consciousness comes the cessation of name and form. From the cessation of name and form comes the cessation of the six sense media. From the cessation of the six sense media comes the cessation of contact. From the cessation of contact comes the cessation of feeling. From the cessation of feeling comes the cessation of craving. From the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging or sustenance. 
From the cessation of clinging or sustenance comes the cessation of becoming. From the cessation of becoming comes the cessation of birth. From the cessation of birth, then aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair all cease. Such is the cessation of this entire mass of stress and suffering. So now we're in a position to go back and see how Buddha Ghosh's commentary, Buddha Ghosh's arguments in his Vishuddhimaga actually go against the philosophy of the Buddha. They go against the truths revealed in the suttas. Because the Buddha says, if you can cut craving, then you automatically attain Nibbana. Huh? In other words, Nibbana is a negative thing. It's not a positive thing. In fact, it's not a thing at all. It's simply the lack of becoming, the lack of craving, the lack of nutriment to the process of birth and death, continuing over and over again. It's pulling the plug. Now, my guru used to give an example. If you have a fan and you pull the plug or you turn the switch off, the fan doesn't stop right away. It takes some time for it to use up its acquired momentum and come to a halt. So similarly, even if a person attains Nibbana, even if a person is able to stop feeding the process of becoming, it's not like they simply disappear. They don't die. In fact, apparently from the outside view, nothing changes at all. But from the inside, everything is different. Everything looks completely different to a person who has no craving. So this is why to a person like Buddha Ghosh, the Buddha's teaching makes no sense. It doesn't come together logically on paper. And if you do an ontological analysis of the terminology in the Buddha's teaching, you'll find that while all the terms are defined perfectly logically in terms of each other, still there are logical gaps. It doesn't come together like a material science or like an ordinary philosophy should. So Buddha Ghosh and the other commentators were trying to fill in these gaps with their own explanations. The only problem is they weren't practitioners, and they didn't know that those gaps are filled when you practice the teaching. When you practice the Buddhist teaching, the experiences that you have automatically lead you to the cessation of suffering, and you start to see for yourself how depriving this process of nutriment then leads to wonderful things. <laughs> indescribable things, beautiful things, but things that are beyond all words, things that are beyond all reason and logic, that cannot be explained. This is Nibbana. So we have to understand the Buddha's teaching by practicing it. He says, come and see. Come and see. Don't just stand on the sidelines and watch. When you're at a sporting event and you're standing on the sidelines watching the team members run around on the field, that is a completely different experience, a completely different point of view than being down on the field in the game. When you're actually participating, when you're actually involved, engaged, doing it, you have a completely different point of view. And from that point of view, a lot of things make sense that don't make sense to the spectator on the sidelines. That will never make sense to the spectator because he doesn't have the experience what it's like on the field. And the same is true of these commentators. They say that uh, Nibbana is not due to cutting craving. The Buddha says it is. But who is right? Well, anybody who actually practices this teaching will tell you the Buddha is right. The Buddha is right. If you can cut this craving, if you can stop feeding the tiger, 
then gradually all the causes of suffering cease all by themselves. The Zen people have a wonderful saying that just sitting, doing nothing, the spring comes and the grass grows all by itself. That we don't need to do anything to attain Nibbana. In fact, it can't be attained. It can't be obtained. It can't be made mine. Because if I am, Nibbana cannot be there. As soon as I am gone, and I'm not feeding this process of acquisition and possession and identification and projection and all the stuff that goes into mind making and eye making. Once that's gone, then Nibbana is there. Nibbana is always there. Nibbana is already there in all of us. But we cover it over with all our busyness and our eye making and mind making and all of our illusion and projection and stuff. This is ignorance. This is ignorance. So the Buddha says, with the reminderless, complete fading of that ignorance, then gradually all the rest of the dominoes in the chain fall down. And it's done. So trying to explain the position of an ignorant person, the Buddha gives the example of a leper. He says, suppose, Magandiya, there was a leper with sores and blisters on his limbs, being devoured by worms, scratching the scabs off the openings of his wounds with his nails, cauterizing his body over a burning charcoal pit. Then his friends and companions, his kinsmen and relatives, brought a physician to treat him. The physician would make medicine for him, and by means of that medicine, the man would be cured of his leprosy and would become well and happy, independent, master of himself, able to go where he likes. So, in other words, when we're suffering, when we have this disease of eye and mind, which the Buddha compares to leprosy, <laughs> Leprosy is a very serious, a horribly disfiguring disease. And so is I and mine. It makes people ugly. It makes them do stupid things. So when we have this disease, we're like a leper who is trying to just assuage the pain by holding his limbs over a fire, roasting them on the fire to dry up the sores and heal the scabs. He's in a desperate situation. He'll try anything just to get the pain to go away a little bit. And that is similar to the situation of the beings who are suffering in samsara. The Buddha says they don't know any better. So they try to cure their suffering with sense enjoyment. And because of this, of course, they only create more suffering for themselves because this just feeds the process of becoming with nutriment of contact, you see, with the nutriment of fabrication, of intention. Let me enjoy this world. Let me enjoy all these things. This just creates more suffering and traps people further in the process of birth and death, in the process of becoming. Paticca Samuppada. So to get rid of this suffering is like when the doctor comes and gives medicine to the leper and heals all his infections. And then he can be well and happy. He can be master of himself. Because as long as he was suffering from the disease, then the disease was his master. The suffering was his master. The suffering pushed him this way and that way and made him do crazy things like roasting his limbs over a fire. So when we become master of ourselves, then we can go anywhere we want. You see? So different religions, including religious Buddhism, talk about accumulating merit to go to higher planets or to go to a better situation of life where things are more comfortable, more luxurious, more opulent, we have more facility. And the idea is with that more 
facility will attain enlightenment. But actually what usually happens is that one misuses that facility for sense enjoyment and simply comes back here again. And so the whole thing is for naught. The real process is to cut this root now, to cut this craving now. Stop craving for heavenly planets. Stop craving for opulent rebirth. And let go of this craving to let go of these four kinds of food that nourish the process of becoming. And what are they again? Physical food, gross and subtle, contact, consciousness, and intention. So obviously we can't stop eating. <laughs> That's not practical. But we can reduce the amount of contact of the senses with their objects as much as possible. And we can also reduce the consciousness, which has a very specific definition in the Buddha's teaching, of the consciousness that arises at the point of contact with the senses and their objects. And we can also reduce the intention to enjoy this material world and transform it into the intention to attain enlightenment. Now you might say, well, the process of attaining enlightenment is also a process of becoming. And that's true, but it's a special process of becoming because it leads to a state where there is no more becoming. It leads to the end of samsara. <laughs> We're in this process of becoming all the time anyway, whether we realize it or not. But due to ignorance, we don't understand it, and so we simply continue to feed it. So the idea of the Buddha's teaching is to stop feeding the process of becoming. Let it go and allow the whole thing to stop, to end. And there's something wonderful there. It's called Nibbana. It can't be explained. And this is why, again, no systems are adequate to approach Nibbana. The complete Buddha's teaching is there, and you should be familiar with all of it. I read through the whole Tripitaka, or Tipitaka. It took me two and a half years. But I'm so glad I did, because now I understand the teaching in its entirety. Not just one little slice of it, but the whole thing. And I can tell you that the Buddha's teaching is correct, even though it may not seem to be logically consistent because you have to practice it. When you practice the Buddha's teaching, you automatically experience the things that fill in the gaps, that explain all of the logical, so-called logical inconsistencies in the, in the suttas. So take our advice, become a fundamentalist. <laughs> This process of the Buddha's teaching should be enjoyable. It should be pleasurable. It shouldn't be that you're sitting there on the cushion, grinding away, bored out of your mind, knees are hurting. Oh, that's, that's misery. That's, that's horrible. Why are you doing that to yourself? It should be pleasure. It should be beautiful. And if it's not, it means you're doing something wrong and you're not going to get the result. Well, you'll get some result, but it won't be what is described in the Buddha's teaching. It won't be the cessation of ignorance, the cessation of craving, the cessation of existence, nibbana, cooling. Huh? We have to get away from the fire of craving to experience the cooling influence of authentic nibbana. Sabbe satta bhavantu sukhi tatta bhavantu sukhi tatta